All right, looks like we are live. Welcome everyone to another week of Coffee DH. Um, I am Dad Robot, and with me is my wonderful co-host Coach Jero, and our lovely guest Nat, uh, aka Darafa Nat. We're going to be talking about some really awesome stuff today: um, philosophy and uh, theory of commander. Nat. You're our special guest. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Let's go uh, favorite food, uh, place you want to travel, and then your f- current favorite commander deck. Ooh, okay. Um, favorite food is easy. Um, it is stuffing. I will eat stuffing year-round, um, not just at Thanksgiving because I love it so much. <laughs> um place to travel um honestly anywhere i haven't been before um i know that's so general but like i don't know every place is cool i can't pick a i can't pick a a singular cool place all right. Uh, um, no, new experiences like that's that's a big yeah. thing about it, right? So yeah, totally makes so- sense. Yeah, so yeah. probably, like, not somewhere I've been before, as much as, like, I love the places I've been. Like, it's I think it's always fun to explore new places. Um, and then favorite commander at the moment. Mm-hmm. Oh, gosh, that's so hard. I love all of my commanders, which is great for what we're talking about today. Mm-hmm. Um, but, oh, it's so hard. I love them all. Um. got this i have faith in you gosh my favorite deck of all time is probably my umbris deck just because yeah. it's, it's it's my love it's my pet deck yeah what's uh you want to give us a rundown of like what it does what the game plan <laughs> is yeah so um if you don't know um umbris is a horror nightmare tribal deck um that essentially the whole idea of the deck is to make umbris as large as possible by exiling your opponent's libraries and graveyards um, and then swinging out with lethal commander damage. So that's kind of the whole spiel of the deck. Um, People tend to hate it, um, but I love to play it, so. Wonderful. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Awesome. Yeah, and... uh, Tell us a little bit about uh, your your content. You're also a content creator. What are some things that you enjoy doing? What do you think is... This is kind of a big question, so if you don't have a ready yeah. answer, totally fine. But, like, what what do you find is, like, your place in the commander community? Where do you find your home? Yeah, so I mostly do commander content um, because that's mainly what I play. Um, I stream on Twitch, I do other things on social media, I write a, I write a lot, um, which hasn't been published yet, it's all kind of in my documents on my computer, mm-hmm. um, I guest on podcasts a lot, talk about, um, Commander, um, you see me guest at a lot of events. Um, my biggest thing about magic and my place in the community is I really want the game to be as accessible as possible for people. Um, my origins began playing, as I'm sure most people did, um, playing kitchen tabletop Mm -hmm. magic with, um, with my IRL group who still meets weekly to play magic. So... Um, I kind of think about them when I'm doing content and I'm out in the, the magic community, just thinking about how how can we make it more accessible for people to do that and how um, can we get people to enjoy the game um, and have a positive time because I love the game and I want people to love it as much as I do. So That's awesome. Yeah, I think that uh, being really inclusive and inviting to the community is super important, and I'm, I'm right with you there. That's so cool that you are able to offer that and be kind of a, a guiding light, so to speak, to people in that way. Um, yeah, well, 
this week we've come together and are gonna put our heads together on how to build decks that will actually like playing um, and I think this is something that happens a lot I'm a big brewer but at the same time for the longest time it must have been where I couldn't find a deck that or I would often find decks that I played once or twice and they just weren't fun I didn't enjoy them um, and that's kind of what we're going to talk about today is how to create the decks such that you will enjoy them, uh, which over the course of time, I think uh, all of us have a lot of experience in building decks in general, commander decks too. Um, yeah, so first off, I have uh, one thing that is kind of near and dear to my heart, and I love putting big stompy stuff in decks. Um, and that almost always means that it's a deck that all love. Uh, I love swinging in with Itali and exiling stuff off the top of people's libraries, seeing that moment of horror and suspense on their face, and then just casting a bunch of terrible, not actually good things afterward. But it was fun in the moment. So, big stompy stuff. What do you guys think? Is that something that you would say is, is your jam too? Um, uh, yes and no. Uh, I think you bring up a really good point there. I think every person has a play style in Magic. Things that they love to do when they when they play their decks. Um, for me, I love building tribal decks. Mm -hmm. But none of my tribal decks do the same thing. So, um, I do have some decks that have big stompies. Mm -hmm. But I also have decks that, um... My big stompy decks, like I think about my newest deck, my Lozon Lasagna deck, uh, as I like to call it, nice. um, which is dragon tribal, so it's big stompy dragons, um, and then Lozon deals additional damage um, with their mana costs. Um, but I think of like my Chatterfang deck, which is tribal. Mm -hmm. I usually don't win by big stompies because um, squirrels really aren't that big. Um, they're one ones. Mm -hmm. Usually in that deck, I'm winning through sacking, and um, same with like my Gris deck. It's usually sacking creatures. So um, very different tribal decks. Yeah. Um, but I think everybody kind of has like a play style they like, um, from and and play styles that they don't like. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So like when you're when you're dealing with. Uh... When you're talking about, like, big stompy, and in general, when you go over to tribal, it's all combat damage. So you're orienting yourself in a way that combat damage is going to be your your win condition in such a way, right? Um, or that there's, like, some really good synergy in between the creatures when it comes to tribal. Mm -hmm. um, but all in all, you're trying to, to amass a board state and then eventually swing with it for the win. And I think that orienting yourself toward a certain win condition like that uh, says a lot about uh, you as a magic player and what you actually enjoy because you'll be able to figure out what that is and we're going to go through all of those in this episode but uh, Jiro what do you think? Well <clears throat> it's interesting to mention tribal decks because of course I have my uh, I used to have tribal Tuesday streams I have my uh, <clears throat> quote of arms podcast which uh, people have drafting out on there sometimes <laughs> uh but yeah, it's interesting to see how tribal decks can wind up having different flavors um, and function very differently, even though some people might say they're just a bunch of creatures that are similar put together. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> depending on the colors that you use, depending on the types of creatures and the strategies that you use, it can be very different. Um, I have a, a uh, Roshin Mindrer Hydra deck, mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> which is just designed around giant X spell Hydras. Uh, so it's more of a ramp deck, and the hydras that I'm ramping into, or the creatures that I'm ramping into, just happen to be hydras. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah. So I think that that's a a good, a good first point, right? So how do you want to win? And there are there are a few ways to win, Commander. Right? There's there's always the aggro, like I'm gonna hit you with big creatures. There's the combo uh, player who's going to want to do something absolutely nutty and assemble a 12-piece chicken mick whatever. Um, and then you've got the the more, like, 
control-oriented players who are going to win with probably, like, one big spell at the end of the game. Um, and when you're when you're talking about that, when you're going into dealing with, like, what your win condition is, I think that that's a good starting point. Because then you can work backward and say, okay, how am I going to get there? Um, yeah, input, thoughts, feelings, ideas. Yeah, um, I like to include multiple win conditions in my decks, so that way you know that you're not playing your... And this is where it comes in where people get bored of their decks. If your deck's doing the same thing every time you play it, you're going to get bored of it. Mm -hmm. um, so I like to include like a couple different ways to win. So um, I'll, I'll bring back the Chatterfang deck for an example. So I can win through big stompy kind of um, by bringing out like crater hoof um, mm -hmm. when I have 20,000 squirrels out. Um, but the other way I can win is through like Bolus of Citadel where mm -hmm. I'm, um, I have some aristocrat type things in there where they combo with Bolus of Citadel so I can pretty much kill everyone just by sacking 10 squirrels. Um, so I think including multiple ways to win is also helpful in your decks just because it gives you kind of some diversity within your decks so that way it's not so linear that you feel like your deck is just doing the same thing every time you play it. That's a great point. Jira, what? Sometimes you do play the same thing. You can do this by <clears throat> putting it on. I like to put it on to put decks on the razor's edge. Mm -hmm. To uh, a part of that is the kerosene and matches uh, decks that I build that share a resource and try to use that resource before an opponent or better than an opponent. <clears throat> Uh, that doesn't have to be that way. Uh, sometimes it's uh, intentionally building a weakness into a deck mm -hmm. and seeing if you can find a way around it. Uh, for example, I mean, there are some colors that just naturally have weaknesses. Uh, like mono black naturally has a weakness to enchantments. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so seeing if there are ways to build your deck either to take advantage of that or to leave that door open and understand that you're leaving a door open. Uh, I happen to be a uh, spell sling. I like instants and sorceries and I don't really like permanence that much. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> even if I'm playing permanence, they're usually not creatures. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> so where that comes in is I wind up leaving myself vulnerable to being attacked. And I'm okay with that. I build that into my decks. So it's kind of my race is, can I keep a low enough profile that, that I'm not just drawing the ire of everybody at the table and <clears throat> find a way to win a game without a, bo without a board state or a significantly large board state or making a board state out of nothing. So building a challenge in tier deck is kind of what you're talking about. Yeah, building a challenge, building an inherent weakness, mm -hmm. uh, especially with the style that you like to build. Um, <clears throat> sometimes that's uh, I'm going to play a bunch of small flyers, and so the inherent weakness is that somebody could build bigger than you. Yeah, so we've got that. We've got... Uh build kind of a challenge into your deck, uh, have well-defined win conditions, but make them very versatile or able to be accomplished different ways in your deck. Um, yeah. Another one that I think is really fun is just have stuff to do every turn. Like, put stuff in your deck that says, all right, at the beginning of your upkeep, this triggers, and you at least get to do something that turn if nothing else comes up. Or uh, same with, like, activated abilities. Just the ability to do stuff on your turn, I think, makes decks that I enjoy playing more. I kind of came to that conclusion while I was building Jan Jansen, and I always had something to do in that deck. 
um, because either the commander was tapping to sacrifice an artifact and make two other artifacts, or some random activated ability of an artifact on the battlefield came into play, and I was able to do something with the deck. Um, yeah, I think that activated abilities and like each turn triggered abilities are kind of cool uh, and just help you have a more full play experience, if you will. Yeah, I agree with that. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. So, uh, yeah, I think gosh. the other one that's let's let's talk about pet cards here for a second, and we have the the absolute king of pet cards over here, um, and also you know uh, me and Nat are too. Um, <laughs> so, Jero, let's talk about pet cards here. Uh, what's your what's your favorite pet card? Well, I mean, the one that I'm going to throw everywhere is on something because it's my, it's my favorite card. And it's a yeah. somewhat obscure card to have as a favorite. Um, <clears throat> but I like it in multiplayer because it can be used as a political tool. It's just all kinds of different places uh, that it can be used. Um, <clears throat> it can be used to set up a counter spell uh, or to counter something that you couldn't, uh, or to help you counter something that you couldn't counter when it came down. Maybe it wasn't a problem then, maybe it is now. It can help you uh, <clears throat> to delay a threat. Maybe somebody else got the turn one soul ring, and so they're able to put out a giant threat. And so you say, you know what, I want you to play that at a more reasonable time. Uh, <clears throat> that's something that unsummons can do. Uh, and sometimes you unsummon into a wheel, which mm-hmm. is always nasty. Uh, just ask Hoff uh, when I do things like uh, unsummon a chroma and then windfall. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> and when you can do these effects many, many times, you can start to create a strategy within your deck where the unsummons aren't just bouncing things, they're working together with the other elements of the deck. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> that's where one of the things that I do, it's a little different from what Matt was talking about earlier, is I look for functional reprints. Mm-hmm. And there have been a lot of them recently for certain specific like niche effects. So when a new set comes out, I look at the commons and uncommons, and I look for any functional reprints of cards or effects that I like to play. Uh, one of the big ones that's had a lot of support recently has been Sign and Blood effects. Um, <clears throat> so Sign and Blood targets an opponent, or targets a player, really. That player draws a certain number of cards and loses that amount of life. Uh, <clears throat> there are about nine or ten of them now. Uh, at least four of them are new in the last two years. And if you can have a bunch of effects that do about the same thing, then even though you have a 100-card deck, you can have a lot of synergy within it. Mm-hmm. That's where I made my Demir Burn deck, which uses those as the primary card draw. So instead of playing cards like Preordain, I'm playing cards like Sign in Blood so that I can have uh, Underworld Dreams out, target somebody else, and now they're drawing two cards and losing four life. And I don't have to hope to draw a burn spell because every spell is a burn spell. Yeah, I like that. Let's see here. As far as like pet cards go, let's see. Nat, do you have any pet cards that you you'd want to just throw out there? Oh, <laughs> um, if anybody knows me, they probably know this. Um, Bloodforged Battle Axe is my absolute favorite card in Magic. Um, I do not put it in every deck because I know it's a pet card and I know it's not good in every deck, but I love that card so much. So if I do have an opportunity or I do see an opportunity for it to go into a deck, it will go into a deck. Um, I love that card. I love having like 60,000 axes out on the field. Um, I think it's, it's just fun. (laughs) <laughs> it's wonderful yeah just just so many copies and obviously you have to play arden in that deck so you can equip all of them to one creature uh, yeah uh, i um like i put it in my cat deck which 
you know, it probably doesn't need to go into my cat deck, but I think it's I, it's fun, you know. When I, if I can get it out, like if I have it in my opening hand with a creature that costs one, I can get it out really early and then just start making copies from the get go. So, um, yeah, just it's a great card. Great. I love that card. Yeah. Some people hate it, but I love it. It's my pet <laughs> card. Uh, one of my buddies pulled it in the uh, in the pack. I got him for his birthday, and we were like, "What in the world are we gonna do with this thing?" And I, <laughs> I, I think that he, I think he'll figure it out eventually. Just like. Also, like, the limitless stream of artifacts that you end up getting from it is nothing to sneeze at, right? Like you Right, can... yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, for example, like, um, in my cat deck, um, I have Leonin Arbiter, um, which reads, uh, not, Le- not Artificer, it's the, not Arbiter, it's the, uh... Um, is it the Abunas? Uh, uh, Leon and Elder. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a one cost cat <clears throat> that whenever an artifact comes into play, you gain a life. Yo. So, say that's in your opening hand with Bloodforge Battle Axe. So, I play that with my one white mana on turn one, get Bloodforge Battle Axe out. Um, so, then you already gain a life. And then every time it copies, you're gaining life from that creature that you're equipping it to. So, it's like a really good synergy. Um, with that card in my cat deck. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, the the uh, the first uh, card that my mind goes to when I think of Blood for Battle Axe is actually uh, Fathom Fleet Sword Jack. Have, mm. have either of you played that one? It's, no. uh, it's three and a red, and when it attacks, it deals damage to uh, the opponent it's attacking equal to the number of artifacts you control. So mm-hmm. if you've got a crap ton of copies of Budforge Battle Axe, you're just dealing so much damage uh, mm-hmm. to that opponent afterward. Um, but yeah, that that limitless stream of artifacts, like that really can come into play heavily late in the game. I like that. Um, my favorite pet card, which I guess, like, if it's good, is it still a pet card? But I love it. Uh, Rakdos Charm is mm. like an absolute go-to for me and if for no other reason than i built one of my friends uh his first edh deck and it was cranko uh, just because it was easy and you know uh here's you know a hundred goblins well i'm gonna play Rakdos charm um and it just comes in handy so often because the other modes are uh destroy an artifact and exile target player's graveyard um mm-hmm. It's just such a great card all around, like just a well-rounded, versatile card, um, which I think is pretty essential for me enjoying a card, just having a lot of different ways that you can play it, um, which I think Jero is kind of what you were referring to with Unsummon. Like it just has a lot of different modes, like it becomes a modal spell even though it's not uh, necessarily modal on its face value. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> um, yeah. What do you guys think? What are some different things that you would say go into building the decks that you just, like, really love playing? Um, I, for me, I always um, look for a variety of synergies. Mm -hmm. um, Because commander decks are large. You got a hundred cards. Um, You're not going to pull all of them. Um... Unless your deck is built to pull all of them. But, um, so you have to make sure you have a variety of ways your cars uh, synergize. Um, and, like, in multiple effects. So, um, I'm not saying every card should do different things, but you should have a couple cards that do the same thing because you're not going to draw. You know, say you are going to be doing a lot of card draw, you can't just have like a reliquary tower and not throw in a thought vessel um because you might not pull that reliquary tower and then you might not get the effect you're wanting in your deck um so i think that goes into a lot of my deck building is just making sure my deck can do what it's supposed to do um kind of no matter what i'm drawing um tribal helps with that because um tribal you're getting effects off of what you are putting together no matter what um 
but like my Quaza deck, for example, is Aristocrat's card draw. Um, so I have multiple, I have a few different stacks pieces in there, and I have a few different ways I can win the game by drawing out my deck. I have um, cards that let me draw. I have cards that let me draw and my opponents draw. Um, so I think just including synergies and including multiples of them so that way your deck is always doing what it's supposed to be doing absolutely yeah uh focusing heavily on synergy over i I think that when you're talking about in particular casual edh Mm -hmm. uh, focusing heavily on synergy is going to lead you to a a better result than just saying this is the most efficient highest power thing that I can Mm -hmm. possibly play. Um, And you'll get more of that interaction inside of your deck and feel like it's a bit more cohesive. It's not just a bunch of parts that when you you play, oh, let's say like, you know, Vampiric Tutor into, you know, whatever different combo Mm -hmm. you're you're playing at the moment or whatever uh, game-winning card you have, Green Sun Zenith out Crater Hoof or whatever. Um... When you have those different play options, um, tutors I don't think are inherently problematic, especially if your deck has like a really narrow focus. Um, it's going to be harder to make that like as fun, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I, <laughs> I totally, I totally agree, and I think that's where people in casual will get to the point where they get bored of their decks because if they're building the most optimized deck they can. Like I said earlier, that's just linear. You have a certain way you win um, or a certain way you play the deck every time. You're going to get bored of it. Um, So I think the synergy part helps a lot with that. Mm -hmm. Um, So that way your deck is is playing as it should, but it's not playing the same way every single time you play it. But if that's something you enjoy, then by all means, like, if, if you like the linear play and that's what makes you happy and you don't get bored of that deck, then then by all means, like, I'm not saying you shouldn't do that, but um, I just know I have friends that come up to me all the time. Oh, I'm bored of this deck. Do I, like, take it apart? Do I rebuild it? Do I... Uh, I feel like I need to make a new deck. Um, but it's just because they're building it so linear and optimized that they're not... they're not getting much out of that deck. I've also uh, come to the conclusion that I really like modular decks. Mm. So, so just like uh, Kess, my, my Kess reanimator build. I have uh, 15 creatures that I can swap out for any 15 creatures, and the deck will still function because the core is there. Um, it only runs two tutors, one of which is Gamble, so you don't actually know if it's going to work. And the other one is the uh, Rune Scar Demon, so you're actually getting the card to your hand out of the deal. Um, but it's a six-six flyer; you can get out with Reanimate, so I'm not going to complain about that. Um, yeah, having those options as well, I have found is really nice because you like uh, Atla Polani is another, and uh, even any of these like crazy like doesn't really matter tribal kind of decks. Um, you can do really effective modular builds with because it doesn't particularly matter which cards you slot in as long as the core of your deck functions like you need it to. You're going to be able to have... uh, And if you don't know which cards they are when you're like randomly choosing this stack of 15, uh, it's going to be a surprise every time. And that's always kind of nice. Because it's like opening a present. You're like, oh, I didn't expect to get this random Shivan dragon out of this one. Oh, what well. What will I get today? Yeah. Um, so I like modular for that particular reason. Um, and that's kind of along that same line, right? Like providing yourself the versatility to win in different ways. Like that's really what the, the encompassing thought is for all of this. Right? It's interesting because I kind of feel the opposite. Mm-hmm. I want my decks to do the same thing every time to do them consistently to function properly so that I know whether or not it's a thing I enjoy. Uh, Sometimes I can find that if I'm building a deck that isn't like that, that I don't know if if it's the deck that I don't like 
or if I'm just not playing it well or not drawing the right cards. It's hard for me to effectively evaluate whether the thing is fun if it's not consistently doing the thing. Uh, additionally, as somebody who's uh, has been streaming Commander fairly regularly mm -hmm. uh, for a, a, well, since the pandemic started, um, I find that the more I simplify the deck, the more I can enjoy other aspects of the game. It's not just about, is my deck working? It's not just about, do I like the deck I'm playing? But there's also, <clears throat> am I paying attention to everybody at the table? Am I being a good host? Um, is everybody having fun? Am I able to help work out complex things when they come up? So uh, maybe that's just the role of the host. Mm -hmm. But I also find that I like to make my deck simpler so I can enjoy other elements. The more complicated my deck is, the less present I feel at the table. Mm -hmm. I think that sometimes I, I get that same feeling uh, in a different way, right? Because when, when I get a little bit like di disassociated from, from gameplay is really when the stack gets six cards deep and things are like there's so many different interactions happening that it's hard to track. Uh, that's, that's when I, that's when I check out of a game most of the time. Uh, so if there's like interesting stuff going on, even if I like, I love playing my friend's decks because that's another thing that you can do. Like, don't just rely on your own stuff, you know, swatch, yes, yes, swap yes, yes. decks because everyone has their stuff and everyone wants to see their deck work regardless of whose hands it's in. Um, so yeah, I would I would heavily ad advocate for that. And then nobody knows what's going on. And I think that kind of like chaos element in in a way that's not like, you know, warp world cre creates a different play experience for the table uh, and something that's just in general more fun. I agree with the player friends deck for it's for a completely different reason. But um but also for the fact that you can see how your deck because when you're playing your own deck, you kind of have this one-sided vision of, like, how your deck plays against other people. Um, and it kind of helps you gauge the power level when you see someone else playing your deck against you. Um, but um, I I also love the idea that you're, you're playing different things and you're learning what you like and what you don't like. So for me, like, I don't like playing Exile decks. Mm -hmm. Like from the standpoint of like, I'm playing things out of exile. So I don't like Prosper. Um, I don't like uh, Gerard, G Gerard? I can't never pronounce it. Um, so I don't like those decks where you're relying on playing things out of exile. It's just not my thing. Um, but I wouldn't have known that without playing, playing those decks. Yeah. So. Yeah, I think when it comes down to it when we're when we're building when we're building our decks because that's kind of like the point here that we're we're trying to get to building it uh and this is a, a question from the audience which i think we've kind of a answered do you think giving your deck a ton of synergy can lead to linear plays um and i think that when we're when we're answering that question synergy uh and repetitive effects can if if you have a ton of repetitive effects, I think it can lead to linear plays. Or if you have a ton of tutors, it can lead to linear plays. Um, but synergy, generally, the deck is going to be doing something similar, but it's not going to be doing the same thing. Um, it might accomplish the goal the same way, but you might be able to put the puzzle pieces together in such a way that it's different than the last time, and that's what makes it fun. Um, and that's that's more what I was gearing toward with, with Jan Jansen, because I only had one win condition in the deck, and that was make infinite thopters and swing. But the only way to do that is to find, you know, the five, six, seven pieces that when you put them together finally did that, but there were so many ways to assemble those pieces that it became more of a puzzle kind of deck. And I like, I like those too. I think that when you're talking about synergy, the cards are good in the context of the deck, but they're also good on their own. So you don't require uh, a certain other card to make it work how it needs to work. 
I, everything you just said is exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not meaning to take up all the all the talk down no, here or anything. That, that yeah. was so no, that was that was my my thinking exactly. Like you you just said exactly. Like synergy I think doesn't have to be linear if you build it so that it's linear, like you said, with lots of tutors and cards that do the exact same thing, then yes, it's gonna get it's gonna get linear, but if if it just has synergy, but has a variety of ways those cards synergize together, then it won't be linear. I would also say there's nothing wrong with linear. Hmm. Um, but I was saying earlier about how I, my decks may do one thing, but they're going to do it really well, and it allows me to be more present at the table. Mm -hmm. Linear do isn't bad, and there are other elements that contribute to enjoyment at the table and to excitement than just whether your deck is linear or not. Uh, <clears throat> sometimes it's uh, like with my decks I share a resource and I don't know what anybody else is going to do with it. Sometimes it's just I want to make a Hazard burn deck which is basically 60 cards that hit somebody directly in 40 mountains. Hmm. And there's nothing wrong with that because you don't know who's going to be at the table. <clears throat> Your deck's going to do the same thing every game. It's going to chuck burn at people and then eventually just chuck whatever cards are in the hand as burn at people. Maybe you'll attack with Hazard, But that deck is going to be extremely simple, extremely linear, and can still lead to exciting play patterns because you don't know what's going to happen. Or maybe you wind up in a political situation where you say, okay, I have mana up and I have a card in hand. I can theoretically burn everybody. I don't know if, if playing the card or using it as burn is better. And I can maybe bluff what's in my hand if I don't pitch it to hazard. It. There's still a ton of play to that deck, even though it's extremely linear. Yeah. It's about as linear as I can think a deck could be. It's kind of cool when your commander gives your, you options like that, too, right? Because, like, you, mm -hmm. you have the ability to play it differently. Um, and that actually leads into another question we just got. How can you build to synergies and give players more agency? So, like, uh, give other people more choices and stuff like that? I would say the, the first things that come to mind for me are things like the, uh, you know, uh, your opponent divides these cards into two piles and you pick one. <laughs> Like, that kind of thing, right? Um, and some of those, the cool thing is, like, it goes to your graveyard. So you're able to use it again, or something like that. Uh, let's say the... Uh, this is the second time I've blanked on this card. Um, Factor Fiction. Factor Fiction. There we go. Thank you. Um, yeah, so Factor Fiction, you get cards to your hand, but you also get them to the graveyard. And if your deck is capable of using the cards in the graveyard as well not only have you given your opponent the option even though it's kind of like a a catch catch 22 oh. you know of which cards go to your hand but also which ones are going to your graveyard so you can give them agency in ways like that um you give your opponents agency in ways like that uh same thing with the demonstrate cards really love those i think they're great uh just good for the health of commander in general i think that they should do a lot more of them There's some interesting ways that you can build around certain commanders that way. Uh, one of my <clears throat> favorite players to play with and against is Ben Doolittle, who mm -hmm. writes for Commander Herald. Uh, <clears throat> and he has a, a uh, Tassic pad uh, where the deck is designed to basically self-mill. And I believe it's, it's uh, one of the burgeoning type effects where you can just dump your hand and or so you, you put any lands out and then anything that isn't a land you discard okay so uh one element of the deck is just dumping cards into the graveyard to get tossing route faster and then using the extra lands to activate tossing uh using his delve to make sure that the opponent only has limited options but still providing options for opponents based on what they need. 
Um, so you can you can choose the opponent who's going to give you a card back, and they get to choose the card. So maybe there's a Golgari charm in, or like a Putrefy in your graveyard, and you need to get rid of an enchantment. I think Putrefy gets rid of enchantments. Um, <clears throat> so you can always choose the player who really wants an enchantment destroyed, and have a reasonable amount of certainty that they'll give you the card that, that you really want. Yeah. Yeah, just give yeah, the players. So, Go ahead. So what I'm hearing here is a lot of like cards that that allow political um political play mm -hmm. within your group. Um yeah. I built a deck, um well I haven't built it, but I I brewed it. Um <laughs> it's not together. But I built a Sivris uh Cloakwood Hermit. Um it's uh, from Baldur's Gate. It's the tap sacrifice another creature artifact for each opponent. You mill a card. Then return that card from your graveyard to your hand unless that player pays three life. Um, so it kind of puts your opponents in a predicament where they have to decide whether they're paying life or they're letting you get creatures. Um, so anything that like kind of includes the group I think helps bring a fun environment to your deck and to the game itself. Yeah. And I think we were talking a little bit about this the other day. Uh, the join forces type cards. Uh, same kind of thing, right? Um, yeah, things that involve the other players in like your turn or get you involved in other players' turns, as it were. Um, not in the way of probably Rhystic Study and Smothering Tithe so much, but at the, you know, uh, getting you involved in their turn is kind of interesting. Um. One of my favorite white cards is Tenuous Truce. Um, mm -hmm. from, it's from the newer set, where um, you pick a, an opponent, and then you and that opponent um, will draw on their end step as long as you don't attack each other. Um, yeah, the original truce is one of my favorite cards. Yeah, uh, particularly the seventh edition version of it, because that's my favorite flavor text of any card. <laughs> yeah. uh, Love the it. Seventh edition version, the flavor text is not all victories require defeats. Hmm. That's great. I love that. Mm -hmm. I love effects like that where where you're both benefiting. Um, Especially if, you know, there's a couple of you that are, if there's an arch enemy type deck on the board, um, where you can kind of work together to, to at least get some benefit out of um, trying to stay alive. <laughs> um, kind of taking a little bit of a turn here, but I think it's a good one because all of us do some sort of stream uh, or do spell table or things like that. When you're building a deck for spell table or even for streaming, is there anything specific that you uh, decide to include, exclude? Um, do you actually build decks for stream or do you just use the decks like they are? Um, I don't build decks specifically for streams, but there are decks that I would probably not play over spell table um because they rely on using your opponent's cards mm -hmm. um i think that can be okay but you know when you're playing decks where you have to search their their libraries for something um and you have to like send each other deck lists so that way they can like figure out what's in your deck or they need to see your cards that can get tricky over spell table um I know people who have like, for example, like Tasha, Tasha decks, mm -hmm. um, those can be difficult because you're playing or you're grabbing things from your opponent's graveyards. Yeah. Um, I think it's okay to have like one or two of those cards. Like say you have a Rise of the Dark Realms in your mm -hmm. deck. I think that's, that's fine. Cause that ends up kind of being a win con anyways. Right. Um, but if your deck is solely relying on like using your opponent's cards, it can get difficult over spell table. I'm not saying it can't be done but it can it can slow the game down because you're having to create tokens for all these things that your that your opponents have. And 
the same can be true for if you're playing a deck that gives your opponents tokens. Uh, you can't always assume they're going to have infinity tokens or the right tokens or even just any kind of tokens. Um, I have a couple of decks where they, I might actually wind up cutting them because although they're fun and exciting, they require a lot in terms of maintaining board state, and it can be a little tricky. Like Gore Moldrak, I love that deck, but it's a little tricky when opponents have to keep track of the salamanders and like I played against an opponent in my Skull Symbol server who didn't have token representation and just put dice on playmat, mm -hmm. but the dice were so small I couldn't see them mm -hmm. easily. I didn't know what tapped or untapped was, and it was difficult for me to figure out if there were profitable attacks. You make a good point. I think the tap untap is difficult. I ran into that problem on was that our game on Monday where I thought someone only had one out but they had two and one was untapped and one was tapped but there was no clear I don't remember actually, but yeah, I've I've run into the same issue. Uh Yeah. It, even even at kitchen table sometimes like you can obviously just ask but at the same time, like, if, if somebody doesn't have some sort of token to represent it, I I tend to play a lot of kitchen table uh, and with, like, in-person playgroup type stuff. So I'll, I'll bring my infinite tokens with me and, like, just everybody uses those. But at the same time, it's still hard to expect people over spell table to do that same thing. Um, yeah, so giving giving your opponents tokens, maybe not so much. I would say, like, I guess, like, interacting with your opponent's deck is really what you're what you're talking about. Not necessarily stuff on the board, um, but, like, stealing things, you know, like Agent of Tractory effects is kind of what you're talking yeah. about. And then yeah. same thing with Rise of the Dark Realms. You pretty much hit that already. Um, but, yeah, I would say that anything that requires uh, you to take something from somebody who's on the other side of a screen is probably not great uh, for specifically spell table type stuff. Um, or things like, I'm going to bring up Warp World again because it shuffles around the board, right? Um, mm -hmm. Just basically anything that would require you to reach through the, through the screen and grab something on the other side and bring it back. Because, um, obviously, uh, impossible. That, <laughs> that would be a cool feature for a spell table to have. Um, if they had a way... That you could like pull or drag like a card onto your board that you like took from your opponent or like a token. Um, we need to kind of like a mix. Table. Yeah, kind of <laughs> like a mix between tabletop and uh, and spell table. Um, that would be interesting if they added that. I think. Yeah, because they have the ability to do the card identifier. If you could just drag and drop that onto your your play mat over over the uh, the stream, that would be pretty sweet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, hearing Warp World mentioned, that does remind me that one of the things that you can do to build your decks to be more exciting and entertaining is if you're going to place symmetric effects like that, have a way to break the synergy. Mm -hmm. uh, Warp World can be a deck that frustrates people because it sets everybody back, uh, or it, it is this ultimate chaotic thing, and sometimes can even be a land destruction effect. But if a player is playing, say, a spell slinger deck like what I play, a lot of. Um, so one of the ways to make that less symmetrical and more beneficial to you is to play, say, Smothering Tide or something like that that makes a lot of token permanence mm -hmm. and then Warp World so that you wind up in a beneficial position. Uh, rather than in a neutral, uh, rather than like putting everybody in a neutral position and basically not really affecting things that much, except to have made things chaotic. Chaos for the sake of chaos sometimes gets put in that same position as like stacks for pillow fort. Yeah. Um. Yeah, some of my favorite decks to play against are decks that are, are kind of like those chaos decks. Like, um, 
I'm going to call out a name here, but like Veggie's Tempting Worm deck mm -hmm. is so much fun because basically he plays Tempting Worm and then everybody plays out their deck or their hand. And um, it's just, it's really chaotic. Um, and I I love stuff like that. And I, I'm, I'm going to be that, this weird person, but I also love playing against Goad. I know not everybody does, mm -hmm. but I... I like kind of the chaos that it brings. Um, so I think anything that requires people to participate in the game is will make it more fun, no matter what. Yeah. So just just make sure that you are still moving things forward. Mm -hmm. uh, this is what I would say. Instead of just playing this big splashy spell that ultimately does nothing, yeah. or that like significantly hinders somebody like if you're going like uh, it, it can function like a mass land destruction but when i saw somebody play it with a ton of treasures out that was really exciting and i actually have a plark deck that has a bunch of <clears throat> three mana value or higher token producers uh that are permanents and then it has the suspend warp world in there uh so I can activate the five mana ability of Plard, uh, <clears throat> and warp world all my tokens away, and token producers, and just exponentially increase my board. So I'm using warp world, but I'm using it in a very aggressive manner to exponentially increase my board. Yeah. When you can take advantage of it, it's actually quite a bit better. I've I've debated, uh, and this really doesn't have a lot to do with building decks that you'll love to play, but uh, building decks you'll hate to play against, um, <laughs> is like the, those mass land destruction effects. I've debated running those in something like Zergo Helm Smasher, um, because you can run a full board wipe, and you have a 7-2, and they have nothing. Um, which is not insignificant, definitely um but at the same time like i just can't break i've i've never been able to bring myself to run mass land destruction or you play it with the new artifact that, that's coming out um i i've tweeted about it it's the one where it it prevents extra turn spells but the big thing is you can pay for and tap it to bring back um anything that was put into the graveyard this turn so if you're playing mass land destruction you get all your lands back, and then nobody else does. Um, yeah, second sunrise and such. Yeah, yeah. so um, I don't mind land destruction if the person can, like... It's it's similar to any of those types of effects. You know, like, Cyclonic Rift um, is kind of, like, the big example where, like, as long as you're, like, doing stuff after you're board wiping, I don't care. Um if the game is is and I I run into this problem with my kitchen tabletop group, my IRL group all the time, mm -hmm. where they'll just play board wipes, um, to play board wipes and they're not doing anything after, <laughs> so then the games end up being like four hours. Yeah. So it's like I don't mind those effects if if there's a clear way to wane within the next few turns. That or if it's synergistically working with what you're yes. doing. Yes. So that would be the other the other thing that I'd mention. So we're talking about synergy. We're talking about does that increase or does it make your deck more linear? Yeah, and I don't think that's a problem if you're having your pieces working together. No. So we talked about pet cards. There are also people who have pet packages. Mm -hmm. um, that's something that Moxfield has on it where you can put packages of cards together um, and just port that whole package into a deck. Um, one of the packages I like using is Mass Bounce, like uh, Washout and Evacuation. Because Evacuation into Stormseeker is a hell of a drug. Mm. <clears throat> Bounce your whole board and then smack you for damage equal to the, your hand <laughs> size? Sign me up. That's my favorite kind of unsummon effect. Yeah. Yeah. I'm with you there. Yeah, and... When we're talking about building into synergies. I I think about like a lot of different stuff. There's when I think about a linear deck that I play, uh, Tanazir is a good example of that. It's very linear. It's 
play tiny creatures that either draw cards, untap lands, or ramp in some way. And then you play Tanazir, you pump Tanazir, you swing. And that's it. That's the entire deck. Um, but I find it really fun because it's actually a little bit of a challenge to get there. And also you never know how much damage you're actually going to be able to deal at one time. And seeing that high number for me is a big thing. Uh, which kind of goes back to the big stumpy stuff I was talking about at the beginning. Um, yeah, I don't think linear is necessarily bad if everything does end up working together. Uh, I think what we're referring to as linear is more... You, you don't have as many available play options as far as, like... Because when I think of actual factual linear, I think of... Well, this definitely has repetitive effects and tutors in it, for sure. And I am trying to use the same, like, let's say between five to six cards to win every single game. And, like, when I think of linear, that's what I think of. Um, which is extraordinarily streamlined. Minimum high power, for the most part, at that point. Um, if not ordering CEDH. Um, so... Yeah, linear in the sense that linear in the sense that it's a streamlined strategy, not streamlined individual cards. Does that make sense? Yes. And I I have no I have like I I said before, I have no problem with linear decks. If if that's what people enjoy, then that's what people enjoy. Mm -hmm. I don't personally enjoy that playstyle. Um like, I'm not the person that'll be like, oh, I'm going to tutor and combo off on turn three. That's mm -hmm. not me. Um, I have a couple decks like that, but I don't play them as much because I am a casual player that just wants to have a good time. Yeah. Um, and I'd rather play my janky, I might mill myself out with Gris deck than, <laughs> <laughs> um, than you know, like, playing my Urza CEDH deck. Um which does the Urza thing. So it's like, it, it just depends on the person. If that's, if that's your play style and you, you like to win and you like to streamline, I know we all like to win, but mm -hmm. like, if you like that streamlined way of winning, then totally build your decks that way. Yeah. Um, but if you're, if you're one of those people that wants just like a casual, good time, fun at the table, um, don't necessarily need to win um just there to have a good time then then definitely you might get more bored with those linear decks yeah absolutely and actually i have a i have a question for you nat um jira and i have talked about this a little bit because we both have kind of our own ideas on it but do you use any specific like deck building template or anything like that um as far as like how many ramp cards or like or yeah. like the specific program um yeah uh it it depends on the deck honestly mm -hmm. um it depends on what i'm building um i'll always have you know i'll look at kind of the deck i'm playing decide how many ramp cards i need decide how many um i i do try to include a couple counter spells um and any like fog effects if I need them or um, destruction. It like I said, it kind of depends on the on the deck I'm building. But I I try to take a look and see what the mana curve of the deck I'm trying to build is. So if for I, I know this is this gets controversial with like how many people how many lands people should play in decks. <laughs> um, <laughs> but like for example, my cat deck is very low CMC, so I don't have very that's probably my least land deck. Um, so I, I have a lot of ramp in that deck, um, and I have uh, low CMC creatures. So, And that's kind of how the deck runs, because it's an Eminence deck with Arabo, so mm -hmm. my 1-1 one, one cats end up being 4-4 four, four, four cats anyways. Mm -hmm. so, one of the interesting things about that one in particular is that because... <clears throat> so one of the reasons why I run so many lands in my decks is because... I want to be able to recast my commander over and over mm, again, but yeah. in Rabo, you don't have to. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So, but like in decks where I have high CMC commanders, like 
Umbras, for example, or like my Elminster deck, um, I will I'll put more lands in those. Um, so kind of taking a look at, at what your CMC um, is for most of your deck and then planning lands around that. And it, and it always takes a, a couple play tests. Yeah. Um, I think um, we always talk about, oh, like we built this deck, but it's like it takes a couple times to play it to figure out exactly what that perfect curve is. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I I, I kind of take a look at the deck and see what it needs and, and try to include, and like we talked about with synergies, I'll try to include cards that have similar effects um, just because I know I'm not going to draw that one card every time because I don't play tutors. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so for like uh, Umbris, I have cards that make him unblockable. So I, I have a few in there, but... Um, I think I put four or five in there just so I have I have some chance of, of getting an unblockable, but that's not necessarily how it'll play every time. So And <gasps> Yeah. Oh. Sorry, I just saw the the thing about the D twenty rolling commander. Um <laughs> <laughs> I I wanna build a uh, dice rolling deck so bad. Um I really want to build Space Family Goblinsons, which is coming out in Unfinity. Mm -hmm. um, because I think a deck rolling deck, or a dice rolling deck, sounds so much fun. Um, because I play D&D &D too. So anytime I get to roll mm -hmm. a dice, it just makes me happy. Yep. <laughs> yeah, and that's kind of introducing that, that sense of randomness without actually being like, you're not stopping the game to do the random thing. You're, exactly. It's actually moving your game plan forward, which is kind of what Jiro was talking about earlier. Yeah. Um, the reason that I asked uh, about templating, and this is kind yeah. of speculation. Offer me your thoughts afterward. Um, sure. I think that as we move more into higher densities of ramp and spot removal, we lose a lot of slots that could be dedicated to synergistic cards in our decks. And yes. like having to do those like this the the staple necessities right and increase those particular cards has slowly been like shaving away at like the fun cards that we get to put in our decks over the course of time. I think that's what what separates. Uh, I don't. I guess I'll call it fringe CEDH and CEDH from casual. Um, I think. Like I said, I usually include two to three counter spells in each of my decks, um, and then I'll include one or two board wipes. Um, but I'm not I'm not throwing four to five to six to seven in there because I could put those slots in as more synergistic cards for my deck um, because that's how I how I want to play my deck. Um, it it. <laughs> It all just kind of depends on how your play style. Um, <clears throat> if you're playing a control deck, of course you're going to have more of those cards. Um, but, you know, if you're playing a tribal deck, you're probably not wanting to wipe the board as much as someone who's not playing tribal. Jerry, <laughs> yeah. yeah. what do you think? I, that was just it was just a thought that occurred to me and I have no idea if it's actually relevant or not um so I would say it only restricts creativity if you let it mm -hmm. uh, one of the awesome things about building synergy based decks is that you can find different ways of doing the same jobs um, so my, I mean, I have a huge variety of decks and they all do the job slightly different. Maybe in, uh, so maybe if you're building an aura stack, like my Siona deck, instead of running path to exile, you run pacifism because it answers a creature, but you don't have, or, but you can find it off of the commander's ability. So it works with your deck, 
you're playing a spot removal spell that gets rid of a creature, or uh, if it gets rid of the creature, only uses white mana, uh, relatively cheap removal spell, <clears throat> it actually doesn't give him a land. Maybe we should be playing pacifism more, right? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah I think that's that's been a big discourse um, thing lately is about which spot removal you're, you're playing and whether it benefits. Like that was a whole thing with the um, the article that came out recently from um, um, about Beast but... Within and um, <laughs> whether it's a a good card or not. Um, um, it's unconditional it's, removal. You just give them a three three. It's fine. <laughs> I it really. I think it really just depends on the deck you're playing. Yeah. 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 I'm I'm a big fan of like uh, generous gift and beast within just because uh, green has so much trouble dealing with certain types of permanents that it's like one of the few things that can do it. I know that it kind of breaks the color pie and some people don't enjoy that. But at the same time, you just need that sometimes. And having one in a deck is fine as long as it doesn't become like the norm, right? Um, I think the, the ability for, and this is a more on the topic of design than it is uh, anything else, but I think that occasionally breaking the color pie actually helps the, the game in general just so we do have some ways to deal with things. Uh, feed the and, swarm, another and, great agent. No, go ahead. Uh, and having staple cards isn't a bad thing either. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> for example, uh, I'm getting ready to build a socket when once the, when the new Dominari uh, United comes out. Uh, the way that I build a tribal deck is I basically get every member of the tribe that I can find, and then I start looking at, okay, who does what job? Uh, and are there just generic members that I would put in there? Like History of Benalia, I think, is just a generic member. But there's Birth of Melitus, I think, that uh, searches up a planes. Uh, <clears throat> so I can put that with my ramp. Uh, and the more I can... So the more I can fill the roles that the deck needs with those uh, sagas, the more generic enchantress cards I can put in. Uh, <clears throat> because I'm interpolating those cards into what my deck is already doing. And I can ensure that the deck is going to function first and foremost, and that the deck is going to look unlike other decks that I've built. Because most of my decks don't use Birth of Melitus to find a they would use, say, um, land tax. Yeah. Uh, so I try to figure out where those tribe members fit in the deck. Then I fill in the rest with uh, <clears throat> uh, with some of those like beast within effects, generous gift. It's in green and white, so I can do those. But I might only put those in if. Uh, the enchantments in the deck that are the sagas don't have a critical mass of spot removal spells. I love that you brought up um, Birth of Melitus because I um, actually have that in a deck and, and it'll make sense in a second and I had it in a deck and someone might have been my husband was like why is that in your deck? It's not very good. Um, it was in my Arcades deck. Mm -hmm. So I get two benefits out of it. I get a planes and I get a wall with defender, um, which that deck is wall tribal. Um, so it's like a ramp spell that also gets me a creature that works with my tribal deck. Mm -hmm. So it's like people, people don't always see the full effects of cards um, and that there might be, a, like you said, one might have land tax, one might, might have the saga. Um, so, like, I don't run a land tax in that deck, but I have that Birth of Melitus because it does double the effect for that deck. Mm. Awesome. I'm just glad someone else plays that card. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I like it. I'm always a fan of stuff that gets you uh, a land to hand is just like a, a normal part of its existence. Because I think given all of the streamlining that's happened and people playing less and less lands, yes, I'm looking at you, Nat. Um, you know... <laughs> Only in that one deck! Only in sure, that one sure, deck! Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. No, it's fine. It's fine. It's alright. Just just admit your guilt. It's okay. Um, no. But with Most all of that... my decks have, have decent, yeah, de- yeah. decent lane. Yeah. yeah. Running, uh, but generally, like, not just you, I run 35 in my Luris deck. Um, it's a little bit higher power, so it has some zero drop rocks and stuff like that in there. But at the same time, like, when you're running less and less having something that can search up a land is actually becoming more and more valuable as time goes by, especially if that particular piece synergizes with the rest of what your deck is doing. Um, and especially is, if you're... Oh. oh, sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. I was going to say, especially if you're playing... Thinking of the, the newest set, if you're playing um, multiple colors in your deck, um, because sometimes you'll need specific... Um, specific lands because say you're playing a five uh five color deck a wooberg deck um you're gonna need specific lands so anytime you can search up a land it's gonna be helpful yeah and uh if you're running something like let's say you're doing and and i'm even talking about filtering right because like faithless looting can still find you a land out of your top cards the likelihood that if you are still running like let's say you know 36 ish lands something like that is that uh you're going to probably hit one off of it so running effects like that that are in particular like in the one to two mana range are going to give you a better i hate to say like run these in in favor of lands but at the same time like if you're dead set on not running you know the classic like 38 to 40 at least consider putting these in your deck because i think that th- there's no worse feel bad than missing your fifth land drop and not being able to play for the rest of the game personal opinion <laughs> I'll, I'll tutor for lands yeah if if I'm playing like oh like black blue or something, I'll I'll put in cards that let me draw, and I'll put in in black tutors that let me find lands. Mm-hmm. Like just because I mean, if I'm playing green, I'm gonna be playing like cultivate and stuff. Yeah. But mm-hmm. but sometimes if I'm playing colors that aren't necessarily associated with um. With finding lands, I'll use tutors to find lands. Because <laughs> why not? Because I, I, I would, uh, mm, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say I consider ramp different than like land search as well, because ramp will put something into play that actively increases the amount of mana you normally would have. Um, but searching a land to hand just to make your land drop, like. That's not necessarily ramp. That's just like being on True. par, right? True. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, because if you're if you're making sure that you can hit your land drops in addition to ramping, that's when you're actually going to be ahead in the game. Um, so running more lands actually is as effective as uh, basically putting more ramp in your deck. There was a a time when there was a, a video. I think the prof put out that it was like 48 total sources you know you have uh divided up between your lands and your ramp and that's what you're looking for um which obviously there's a little bit of a flaw to that like because you don't have like a low end cap on lands on that uh but at the same time yeah i think that when you're when you're moving toward getting your your land drops every single turn you'll end up having a far more consistent game and i think that you'll enjoy it more just generally, which is part of part of this exercise is building decks that we actually will enjoy playing. So make your land drops. You'll enjoy playing more if you make your land drops. <laughs> That's also <clears throat> I try to help other players do stuff like that when I'm running my Kerosene and Matches decks. A lot of them run either uh, Collective Voyage or New Frontiers if they're green. 
uh, which lets everybody search for a bunch of lands because I want games to be exciting and entertaining. I want everybody's deck to do the thing. Um, <clears throat> I'll sometimes run cards that let everybody tutor up a certain land if I need to, I need something like that. Um, <clears throat> they have those types of effects in my... Um, in my Kineos and Tiro deck that I actually just built, Kineos and Tiro, made of them, uh, <clears throat> has a few cards to let everybody tutor for lands. Just things to help make sure that not only do I not lose to uh, to those types of effects, nobody does. Because hmm. those do not make for good things. Yeah, I don't think anyone likes playing... I'm trying to word this correctly. I don't think anybody likes to see other people not hitting their lands. Um, I mean... That's probably not true. There are people that just enjoy playing mass land destruction. But for the most part, <laughs> people, I think, like other people being able to play their decks. Because they want to see like what other people's decks do. Um, especially in casual. Um, That's one so... of the reasons why I really got into CEDH. I... It goes back to that 7th edition truce. Uh, just because somebody wins doesn't mean anybody else has to lose. If everybody walks away with a cool story, then nobody really goes away feeling like a loser. Yeah. And I think people enjoy their experience when, even if they lose, if they get to play cool things in their deck, or they get to at least play some some parts of their deck. Um, it's such a different feeling to say yeah. that I was so close versus I really didn't do anything relevant the whole game. Yeah. And that's why I like the initiative mechanic, which I know, I know some people aren't super fond of it, but like the very first thing on that card is search your library for a basic land and put it in your hand. So that allows for the political, like, okay, well, I'll let you hit me so you can hit your land drop. Um, and I like that. I really think that if that was the intention behind the design, I love that that's an option in the game now. Yeah, I mean, you see that happen... Well, at least I see that happen a lot in my games, where you make those political moves, like, hey, can I hit you for so I can do such and such? Mm -hmm. um, and most of the time... I'll say yes because it's it's something that will allow them to play their deck. Yeah. So as kind of like some some ending thoughts because we've we've gone over a lot here. As yes. content creators, what is something that you think that we could do better at encouraging people to do uh, when they're playing their or at least building their decks? Uh, as far as like making things more fun, like what what is the the one thing that if you could say it like this is it for for me? My biggest thing is is and we we've, we've talked about this the whole time. Synergize, synergize, synergize. Mm. Um, make sure your deck does what it's supposed to do. Um, I think that's where people can go astray um if there is not a clear function to the deck yeah jiro what that's do you... it yeah <laughs> no that's good that was great no uh mm -hmm. yeah jiro what do you think don't be afraid of being linear um yeah. <clears throat> So it kind of feeds into what was just said in terms of focusing on synergy. Uh, but just because something is consistent doesn't mean that the game is going to be boring. If you're finding that the game is boring, focus on what other people are doing and enjoy and just generally 
enjoy being at the table with people because no game or so no you're not going to have multiple games that are exactly the same. unless you're in the maybe if you're in the same play group and everybody plays the same decks but i wouldn't say that that's a problem with your deck yeah nice yeah and i'll kind of like close out this round of thought with like choose cards that make your turn feel like you're doing something no matter what that is like i i kind of this was almost the first point that i made was like activated abilities and each turn triggers like those are pretty big for just being able to have something to do on your turn um, and if you consistently have the ability to do that and those cards are synergizing with your total strategy which they should be if you're putting them in your deck um you will find that you actually really enjoy it i think activated abilities are given a bad rap because they're attached to creatures for the most part um but if you can get some stuff that really impacts the game lets you draw a card make a token every turn even if it's just something small it's going to add up over the course of the game so that would be my two cents on that so think about all these points mm -hmm. viewers there is so much that you can do in order to improve your play experience. Um, we talked about like how to have like how to create a fun environment in your pod a couple weeks ago, and that was super fun. We had a lot of similar points really to how to make the game fun for you. So when you're when you're gearing yourself to making your deck, think about those particular things. Um, we're gonna end off here, Nat. Where can we find you? What's some stuff that we can go follow you on and subscribe to so that we can support you as a creator? Yeah, um, you can find me at Giraffinet, uh, spelled exactly like you see it, on pretty much any social. Um, I stream on Twitch. Um, I will be creating some content on YouTube soon. Um, and... Um, yeah, that's that's pretty much it. Yeah, Jira. Um, coach, uh, so at coach underscore j underscore r o on Twitter. <clears throat> uh, I have my Twitch TV backslash unsummon skull. Um, my YouTube is bit that ly backslash unsummon skull. Uh, <clears throat> and I run the Quote of Arms Tribal Podcast, which uh, recently uh, put out its fiftieth episode. Nice, that's awesome. Congrats. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, I'm Dad Robot. You can find me at CQ Crunch, obviously, here on Twitch, as well as on Twitter, and under Commander Quantified on YouTube. Um, with that, thank you both so much for coming. Nat, it was wonderful to have you this week. I am so glad that we got a chance to, uh, to talk to you on the podcast and that we got to have some really great conversations and content together absolutely thank you for having me yeah absolutely let's look for somebody to raid real quick here um yeah there we go you know okay, or, okay. oh go ahead do you have uh, i was asking if you know uh, oki and then underscore doki loki okay okay i underscore d-o-k-i-l-o Yeah, let's do that then. Awesome. And we are headed that way. Thanks so much, everybody, for coming to the stream. We'll catch you later. That's good.